through a series of three or four videos, I propose to offer a personal and at the same time a realistic and objective assessment of the life, mission and achievements of the late Sri K.P. Yohanan. I pray that I be granted the courage to tell the truths without fear or favor, and also that my viewers be granted freedom from either negative prejudices or blind admiration, both of which hinder the free flow of truths. I propose to do this assessment in three or four videos for the reason that uh, there is much to be said about the man and his works, though I do not propose to go into the factual details. My attention would be focused largely on the realities and issues raised by his life, either directly or indirectly, or deliberately or inadvertently. These are real issues and these are issues that Kerala Christians need to face or at least to become aware of. Now the very first issue that I want to address, and perhaps the whole of uh, this video would be devoted to that, is the negative somewhat condescending, at times contemptuous attitude that people have, which they continue to reflect or express towards Sri K.P. Yohanan because of his very humble origin. He came from a family that eked out an existence through ducks farming. Uh, Many find it difficult to believe that a man from that background could become de facto an empire builder in the religious context. Whether he was building his own empire or whether he was extending the kingdom of God or whether it was the case that his personal kingdom eventuated from his sincere attempts to build the kingdom of God upon the earth. These are issues that will remain problematic and much debate will happen, I hope, uh, in, the, in, in the days ahead and they need to be debated. There is no reason why issues have to be dodged out of a false sense of propriety. Nothing matters more than the truth and it's high time Christians learned to confront the truth no matter how unpleasant or inconvenient it is. As far as I am concerned, rather than his hum humble origins constitute a negative reflection on him, it fills me with wonder and amazement that a man who came up from backgrounds such as his could really become a global citizen. Uh, we look in vain for several other instances comparable to this. So surely there was something quite commendable, something rare and unique in him. The one point of encouragement that I derive from his life and work, something that applies to my life as well, though I, I cannot compare myself with him in terms of the scale the magnitude and the grandiloquence of his achievements is that uh, my own life involved a determined and resolute struggle against the tyranny, the restricting um, uh, effect of circumstances. I too had to battle against comparative poverty and insignificance, work hard, of course, I took the trajectory of education and public life, etc. I shunned the possibility of being involved in, in anything outside the country, um, especially in terms of fundraising, etc. But 
The similarity between K.P. Yohanan's life and mine is that in both cases there is a dogged struggle against the tyranny of circumstances. And I therefore cannot but admire the extent to which Sri K.P. Yohanan succeeded in breaking the shackles of poverty, of social limitation, even of inadequate education, so on and so forth. Every odd was stacked against him. So, rather than hold this out against him, I cite this as a point hugely in his favor and as a, an aspect that commands admiration from my side. What distinguished Sri K. P. Yohanan as compared to thousands and thousands of his fellow Keralites was that he had a true, almost matchless entrepreneurial spirit. What do I mean by the entrepreneurial spirit? An entrepreneur is one who can see opportunities where none exists or opportunities to which most others will be blind. Secondly, an entrepreneur is one who is quick to seize opportunities and go all out in making the full use of whatever opportunities come his way. In these respects, certainly, C.K.P. Ohanan is a role model worthy of emulation. And I dare say this in spite of the fact that I know that there will be many who would be upset when I say this, but this is the truth and I cannot but state. Now, his entrepreneurial spirit was aligned to the gospel work, the, evangel the, the evangelistic work, spreading the good news and taking the good news to all and sundry. And in doing so, Unlike most Christians who stay confined to the parochial boundaries, K.P. Yohanan, like Jesus before him, crossed all barriers, all boundaries. And he dared to go into zones and levels and spheres that most others would shun or think ten times before they enter into. Um, so, his entrepreneurial spirit made him realize that if at all he is to become a profitable servant for the kingdom of God, he had to do something on his own. He came from the Marthoma church background and he was only well aware of the fact that church life in Kerala and indeed church life throughout the world and uh, more particularly in Kerala, is, is to, so stereotypical, so hidebound, so tradition-bound, that it's impossible for him to find enough elbow room to express his gospel-oriented entrepreneurial spirit. All of us know that every church is organized in terms of what has been done uh, from ancient of days. And every church I know, and this is from personal experience as well, will be initially dead set against anything that is seen to be out of the way, out of the box, anything that is new, anything that is unfamiliar, anything that has not been tested through decades of uh, experience in the past. So tradition rather than uh, availing opportunities available to take the word of God to people uh, in, in different walks of life is, is something that the church instinctively prefers. And therefore, uh, uh, what aggravates this is the fact that there is an attitude deliberately cultivated and strongly foisted on the members of the church uh, of utter and profitless negativity to anything beyond the boundaries of the church. 
the paradox in the life of the church is that on the one hand there is supposedly a commitment to outreach which means that you go out of your familiar circles and reach people who are uh, way beyond your uh, circles of convenience, comfort and uh, familiarity. On the other hand, the very same church which um, uh, uh, supposedly believes in outreach also promotes an attitude of, of, of negativity to anything and anyone other than what is within the familiar circle of the given church. Uh, I understand that a particular church in Kerala, as part of the baptism service when infants are baptized, once the child is baptized, is, the priest instructs the parents and the godparents in particular to ensure that the child is not touched by unchristian hands. I'm, I'm merely citing this to indicate the degree of negativity that's cultivated as though this negativity has some divine sanction towards the world at large. Now, because of this and a variety of other reasons, church life is 100% stereotypical. It cannot accommodate any new idea, any new, new approach, any new goal. And only that which has been done from ancient of days will be allowed to be repeated. And what aggravates this problem even further is that the church deliberately discourages and disallows lay initiatives. Nothing can happen unless a priest or bishop presides over it. Everything has to be surrendered to the whims and fancies of the priestly class. Only then will a person with some originality of thought, some imagination, some enterprise, or as I said, the entrepreneurial spirit, or someone who has a distinct vision, will be allowed to breathe free, if at all. And K.P. Johannan, being who he is, realized it very early in his life, that if he were to stay a traditional, pious, stereotypical Marthamite, that would be the end of his spiritual life. So I give him full credit for breaking out. Of course, he didn't go out of his way to antagonize his church. He was one who believed in maintaining courteous relationships, and that too is something to be commended in him. But he did not allow the yoke of the church to limit his freedom, the freedom to do the work of God as he understood it and as he deemed best. And I think <clears throat> I salute him for it. Now comes um, an important aspect. Again, related to this, uh, an aspect in which I think of him as similar to St. Paul. You might think that this is a far-fetched comparison. I believe it is not. One very significant thing that Paul said about himself is that he did not believe in building on another man's foundation. He did not believe in building on another man's foundations. In other words, he uh, was a deliberate, self-conscious, intentional pioneer. And that pioneering spirit I found to an astonishing degree in K.P. Johanna. And unfortunately, pioneers also activate insecurity and hostility in very mediocre people. Because there is something called jealousy. As Shakespeare says, jealousy, the green-eyed monster. The jealousy can cause a lot of harm. Jealousy infects you with negativity. And unfortunately, the spirit of Kerala, and particularly the Kerala Christian spirit is, oh, overly influenced by the spirit of negativity. I really can't imagine how a community as negative as ours has survived so long. It's, the problem is that acute. If I were to tell you how I encountered the negative spirit in the Christian community and to what extent I suffered, it would take me a lot of time I don't want to put the focus on me, therefore I'm not going to include any of those personal biographical details. 
So, a pioneering spirit feels suffocated within a context or a framework of utter negativity. Now, unfortunately, this negativity is sanctified by the notion of authority. And in the religious context in Kerala, religious authority is almost always exercised in the negative way. Don't do this, don't do that. Don't go beyond what I say. Don't go beyond what the church allows you to do. Don't do anything in a way different to what the church has been doing for these many years. Don't break the traditions of the church. It's full of don't, don't, don't. The only time do comes is in relation to giving. Do give to the church, do give to the church mission, do give uh, to the, uh, the bishop's uh, cha philanthropic projects of building, you know, houses for the poor. Do give, do give, do give. Otherwise, it's all don't, 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 don't. And since most Christians live in a state of inertia, uh, that is, absence of activity, they're not afflicted by this. This becomes a problem only if you want to do something. If you don't want to do anything, then this is not a problem. For a person like uh, K.P. Ohanan, who was aware of his potential, and who was also aware of the fact the church was organized in this manner. And therefore, if he stayed confined to the church, he would have to die a premature death or end up in an asylum. Naturally chose to cut or, or, or create his own path. And I truly, truly appreciate that pioneering spirit in him. Now, I'll deal with something related to this, and with that I'll close this particular uh, video. The uh, rest of the reflections will follow in another. This pioneering spirit, or to put it differently, this entrepreneurial spirit, was also what took him beyond the boundaries of Kerala. Many people criticize him for going to the United States of America. By the way, he was uh, accepted and respected not only in the United States, but also in several other countries, including Germany and uh, a few European countries, uh, continent, continental countries, uh, as well as uh, UK. Um, now, this also is cited against him. He went and mobilized money, raised funds, thousands of crores, so on and so forth. Yes, he was a remarkably, astonishingly successful fund raiser. No question about it. This is a faculty that I have, uh, you know, regarded with awe and wonder. How could a man succeed to the extent which Sri K. P. Ohanan did in raising so much uh, foreign funding? Now here, leave alone the jealousy fact, which is certainly playing a role in the kind of damnation or, or, or the con not damnation, the condemnation that is heaped on uh, K. P. Ohanan. I want to ask you a question. If K. P. Ohanan had stayed on in Kerala and not gone beyond the boundaries of Kerala, what do you think he would have achieved? How many people would he have been able to help? What progress would he have made in relation to his sense of mission? How many people would have benefited from his fierce loyalty to the soil of Kerala by which he said no to all opportunities to go abroad, to raise funds of course, but also to equip himself? Don't forget that he had the benefit of theological education in the U.S. And it's not only the benefit of a few years of theological education. Even more important is the opportunity to interact with people of great intellectual theological stature. And he had thoroughly enjoyed associating himself with these intellectual giants. And uh, he was deeply appreciative of them. He learned from them. And from them he cultivated a passion for excellence intellectual uh, uh, brilliance, but he was not particularly endowed in terms of his intellectual talents. But let me tell you, what little talents he had, he used to the full, to the full. And the people who tried to prove that, you know, K.P. Ohanan was an intellectual nitwit, 
or that you know he got his books written by others by the way i have written books for others and i don't want to mention uh, some of them it's quite common in this world not many people can write by the way it's not a problem do they have ideas and do they act upon their ideas do they make their ideas count then whether or not they write the books themselves or get it written by somebody else so long as these are their ideas i have no problem with it absolutely none also a person who was as busy as kp ohan and was could not have been sitting at the desk all the time writing his books he has written nearly 300 books do you know how much time it takes to write a book i'm a small author myself when i write a book i invariably invariably begin to write at 3:30 a.m. early morning that go on writing till 9 9:30 in the night in between i would have breaks only for eating my meals thousands and thousands of hours of work go into the writing of a single book single book so if kp ohan and got some of his books written by others the idea is being his i have absolutely no problem with it in fact i congratulate him on that because that's the only way he could have struck a balance between his active mission engagement his commitment to do something and his commitment to reduce his ideas to writing so that he leaves something by way of theological legacy to posterity and he was always mindful by the way something that's commendable in him kp yohanan was always mindful of what legacy he would leave to the coming generations and i'm i can bear witness to this because I, i'm a personal uh, i have personal experiences of it and therefore i cannot but uh, 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 bear witness to it. So, uh, I thank God that K. P. Yohanan went beyond Kerala. Had he confined himself to the soil of Kerala, we would not have been talking about K. P. Yohanan. Now, this is an opportunity for me to say something about Kerala, which worries me a great deal. whether it is kerala churches or it is kerala culture or kerala politics or kerala society or whatever it's all the same kerala is blighted by the curse of utter negativity it's not an accident that kerala is one of the least developed states in kerala though in terms of what the economists list as the indices of development kerala ranks right at the top It's quite artificial and fallacious because Kerala's development is nothing but the money order economy. People from Kerala, because uh, they get the modicum of education here, in the past they had opportunities to go to other countries, and two generations remitted a lot of money, thousands and thousands of crores, and that buoyed up or pumped up the economy of Kerala. Kerala is not industrially developed. Kerala's agriculture today is nowhere. What is the wealth Kerala is producing? Now Kerala is trying to progress in IT, etc., and I appreciate that. But in terms of employment generation, in terms of wealth generation, in terms of providing you know stability for the people of Kerala, Kerala is in a an utter mess. And this is not an accident. This is the necessary byproduct of this. epidemic of negativity from which kerala suffers i'm someone who had to leave kerala most reluctantly at the age of 20 in search of quality higher education in spite of the fact that kerala is considered to be a pioneer in education there are uh, more, and even in those days the approximately about 100 colleges in kerala there was only one university at that time the university of kerala i had to go to delhi in search of good education post graduate education Why is it that we can't maintain world class standards in higher education? Is it because we don't have the ability? No. We are cursed by our mentality. And this goes for everything. You start something in Kerala, you're bound to regret. 
whether it is religious, whether it is industrial, whether it is politics, whatever. Uh, since I mentioned politics, Amatmi Party is a very unique phenomenon in Indian politics. Within, you know, it, it started from nowhere, and um, uh, in no time it captured power in the capital of Delhi. Now they have spread to the Punjab. If you consider the political vision of the Amatmi Party, you'll be excited. If you look at their culture of governance, you'll be astonished. Amatmi Party is just the right political vision that Kerala needs. But Amatmi Party tried to grow into Kerala. It hit the dead end. Nothing can grow here. Many industries have wound up in the past. And industrialists are very reluctant to come and make investments here. As it is crudely put, Kerala survives on two things, income from two sources, liquor and lottery. And I, don't want to, I don't want to say more about it. Uh, it's not a pleasant thing to deal with. So, there is a compulsion to go abroad. If people had not gone abroad from Kerala, Kerala would have been in the pits. So I said Kerala has survived because of the money order economy. Now if it's alright for people to go abroad and work and earn and send the money back home so that people in Kerala live in comfort and laziness, it is not a bad thing to go and raise funds from other countries. Also because Keralites are stingy, they're not generous givers unlike the Americans. America is number one in terms of their generosity to give. You start an enterprise, you start a mission or whatever, you, God's work, etc. Unless and until you do something under the auspices of a particular church, in which case the members of the church would uh, try and support you to a limited extent. If you have a sense of mission which is not uh, conducive or which will not uh, earn the ready support to the church authorities and you want to go your own way, nobody in Kerala will give you five rupees. The very same people will damn you for raising funds from overseas. But of course it, may, it, can, it can be said, it must be said, that the criticism is not so much about raising funds, though that would not be a correct position or 100% honest position, it's because of the volume of the funds raised by Sri K. P. Yohan and from overseas that um, uh, 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 he has raised a lot of uh, eyebrows uh, in, in Kerala. But also the way he has utilized those funds. There are problems in it. In one of my previous videos, I've dealt with it. I want to repeat what I've already said. Therefore, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I, uh, and also because I do not know the full picture from within as to how all these funds have been deployed. But as I mentioned in the previous video, I did raise this issue with KPO and he told me that part of his uh, the funds that he was raising from overseas, he was investing in various sectors in Kerala so that the future needs of the church could be taken care of. And I was not at all in agreement with him and I indicated my disagreement I told him at that time that securing the financial stability of the church is inviting trouble because a people of faith must put their trust not in fixed deposits or landed assets or steady incomes ensured through some other means. They must learn to put their trust in God. And that will be seriously compromised. And also, the moment foreign money comes, I tell you, the devil gets you. I have an experience which I have to mention. I was for some time the honorary chairman of a theological institution in Delhi. It's called the Theological Research and Communication Institute, Tracy for short. This is a small institution, only just one building a library, a little office space, and maybe five, six rooms where guests can come and stay because it was envisaged to be a theological community where people from different parts of the country and some from overseas would come, stay together and develop their theological insights. And then uh, those insights will, uh, will be turned into a book 
a book of books so a thinking researching publishing community theological community so this attracted overseas funding there was funding from germany there was funding from netherlands and there was funding from the uk and i tell you that so long as the overseas funding came in there was absolute corruption in that place no matter how much money came from overseas, there was no money left to do any work. It was all pocketed by the individuals who were in charge. So by 1986 or so, the institution completely collapsed and those who were in charge fled from there. The institution was uh, sunk deep in debts. At that time, I was approached to take over the institution. Uh, with great reluctance, I did. The very first thing I did, was to stop all overseas funding. This shocked all my colleagues there. They thought I was out to destroy the institution. I said, you just wait, we all have to work hard. We will resurrect this institution. And by God's grace, it happened. And by the time I left Tracy, I left a bank balance of 37 lakhs, which is a small amount, but given the way it functioned before when it had very good overseas funding uh, and, and the way it functioned after all those funding sources were abolished, there was a marked difference. Anyway, so I can very well understand why K.P. Yohanan had to go beyond Kerala. I can also understand why he had to tap funding sources overseas. And I can very well understand why he became such a, an amazing hit with funding agencies and individuals inclined to support mission work in India. He had a peculiar knack of touching the emotional core in human hearts when it came to projecting the needs of India, the missional needs of India. Uh, and he could also draw richly from his experiences, which by then had become quite considerable. He was a good communicator, simple, direct, but very, very touching. And um, uh, he became an instant success with people. The people looked up uh, in the United States, they looked up to him. Many adored him. They supported him blindly. Many of them supported to them to the extent of giving him everything that they had. That shows not so much the foolishness of the Americans as also the genius of the man who could have such an impact on them. Now, it's very easy to damn such a person. And we damn him particularly because he succeeded and succeeded in a, to, a, to a mythological extent. There's no comparable instance in our living memory. And that also excites a lot of uh, negativity. So, uh, very quickly, his humble origins, hailing from a ducks farming home, family, hardly any education worth talking about. There was nothing going for him, but he fought a resolute and tremendously successful battle against the limiting conditions of his circumstances. He broke out of their shackles, assumed wings and flew to the west and exercised his God-given talents to the uttermost in creating a wonderfully positive outlook or attitude to what he wanted to do in India and therefore he managed to uh, uh, secure enormous funding which also would eventually prove to be his undoing but I don't want to go more into that at the, at the, uh, at the moment. Uh, I'll close um, my examination of this particular aspect of the life and work of Sri K.P. Yohanan and uh, deal with a few others in the next three or four videos. I request all of you to stay on uh, and, and to continue to view the succeeding videos as well. Thank you.